Hi folks, how's everyone doing? Today I have chai tea in my smaller mug. For a change. Right, just get myself ready for today. Hold on just a sec. Hmm. Perfect. Just trying to get some streaming bandwidth. Maybe up and down a little bit. Anyhow, how is everybody? Please make yourself known if you feel like you can. And then I know who's watching. How is everybody doing this week? I haven't done much on the software front personally. I've been playing about with um, hardware and hardware designs, um, which I may mention shortly. Um, there isn't much in terms of news from what I've seen, not particularly much anything particularly interested in this area it's very quiet at the moment strangely not much activity on the FPGA side of things or the open source FPGA things hi Laurie Oh, Laurie's been doing some cycling. I haven't done any yet this year. I will need to um, get my bicycle out of the shed and give it a service before I um, go anywhere on it. But yeah, the weather's been, um, I'd say, fair to middling for the time of year. Um, let's talk a little bit about hardware and then we'll carry on from where I left off. I also need to update on what I did since the last stream as well. Um, I don't know if you guys ever saw this. It's a bit difficult to pick this up actually because it's all wired up. Um, So one of the um, things that I worked on in the past that I kind of want to get back to in terms of style was a thing called um, tiles. Hold on. Maybe I can unplug this. Ouch. Damn, that's sharp. Uh, I was using it to drive a bunch of these um, infrared flash. Takes a lot of energy over a very short period of time. 
Um, so this here, uh, if you look what's on the bottom of the charm block me, um, you might recognize some of you it's from a few generations back. Maybe if I show you the bottom. That's the old uh, Black Ice 2. So on top of that, I added a an adapter board. There was a little known expansion socket, uh, which you can see that is populated that carry a bunch of the uh, triple IOs on the end up through here and that goes up to a kind of mezzanine level and then on the mezzanine level I can slot in a bunch of smaller um, little boards, power boards for um, operating all sorts of different things so that was a pattern that I started a little while back and I want to continue with that particularly for doing the automation and robotic stuff excuse me a sec I'm being hassled by a cat do you want to go out bear with me a sec folks come on then I'm not giving you any more food. Do you want to go out or not? So that is basically the idea of tiles um, that I started on years ago um, and never came back around to it. So one of the things that I've been working out is how to do the automation stuff in a similar fashion but improving on that <laughs> so for a start what I'd have is um, a board that takes the tiles to start with so the current design from the um, automation stroke robotics board needs to be relatively low cost so that people can play so it doesn't need to be anything as fancy as say an ECP5 um, so at the moment I've got a design and if I can uh, get this up briefly to give you a little preview <laughs> this won't overload my memory I've got a lot of stuff running right now let me I can give you an idea here let me just take a screenshot rather than run this permanently um, So this gives a brief kind of overview. I can share this board, bear with me a sec. So this is a shot of the board. Hold on. Switch to the workbench. Hold on. Oh, how annoying. I 
hate it when my screenshot saves it in a really weird place. Got it. Um, so up here you can see, um, ooh, when it, you won't be able to see my pointy thing. Uh, anyhow, um, so if you look at the image, I wonder if I can just increase the size actually, hang on. Get a little bit bigger. So this is something I'm playing around with on the um, in the CAD at the moment. So in this design, what you can see is basically um, an ice forty based board, baseboard, and you can see in the centre center right you can see that there's an FPGA, a microcontroller and some support circuitry, USB etc. And then you can see around it forming a kind of C, one, two, three, four, five different boards, potentially a six as well, but five different boards, expansion boards. Uh, and on there you can see some motor boards sitting on top, um, SD card, RAM expansion board, um, things like um, accelerometers on one of them. On another one, you can see a, a Wi Fi expansion, Wi Fi Bluetooth expansion, etc. So these little boards would be added on as required for each individual situation. So you'd be talking about something that is done in two layers. So you've got the baseboard with the FPGA microcontroller on it, and then you've got these little you know, five little or six little other boards that go on top and there are different choices for those. And it's designed to be low cost, more importantly, and reasonably low powered because it's got to run off a battery. Not always, but in a lot of cases. Um, and the other thing I was trying to do is thinking, well, if I had the ECP5 as well, could I do an ECP5 version of it? Which is why you see this big connector up here with this dots around it on the left hand side, because that you could make a similar board with six tiles uh, and then have the amalgam on the other side of it, plus a bunch of other expansions. In fact, you could go up to nine expansion boards. Evening, I post. Um, well, the ECP5 is the amalgam board, and I'm working on that. that, that that's not changed. That's the same. Um, but there could be an, uh, an amalgam daughter board that looks remarkably like this, that supports a bit more expansion than this board. Um, but it's for the automation and robotic stuff that this is primarily designed at the moment. And I've just been playing around with it and I just wondered if we could fit the amalgam into there as well. So I've been playing around with the um, um, physical design sizes and stuff to imagine how they would uh, come together to form different solutions. Um, and in this particular one, the automation one, as I say, it'd probably be an ice 40, something like an up 5k perhaps for the FPGA side of things. And then um, probably a, a low powered STM32, a modest microcontroller that will be able to do the programming in the FPGA. It also be able to run Rust and things as well. There'll be some flash, a USB connector. A DFU button, um, a few LEDs, so fairly basic. Uh, most most of the goodies come as expansions that you plug in to do your particular thing for a particular project. But don't forget, because I wanted this to be kind of uh, 
this would be the hardware kit that could be provided in order to follow up with the various um, videos, the how to's on the automation and robotic side of things. So it's just making that as easy to get into as possible. Uh, so I thought I'd just mention that. Um, I don't know if you guys will be interested in the automation and robotic stuff. And again, it will run Black Crab as well. The key really is getting something done at uh, relatively low cost to make it easier to finance. So yeah, I've been doing some work on that as well as Amalgam as well. Um, yeah, well, the robots could be anything really. Um, I think initially I'd probably do one with some wheels on, something mobile, perhaps with wireless. I think that would be nice. Um, there's some interesting parts of that to deal to do with um, things such as automation, uh, hierarchical behavioral controls, how it deals with difficult situations and that kind of stuff, uh, and some distributed uh, control behavior, um, some homing stuff. Um, there's lots of interesting areas really that are good uh, and uh, challenging from a processing point of view, even on something relatively simple and straightforward. But it's about getting basic principles really. Um, and once you've got those in place, you can then use it to control all sorts of different things. Yes, you could control steppers or servos, etc., etc. All of those kind of stem on from some of the simple control systems. My post says uh, I'm more interested in arms with one millimeter precision. I don't know what that means. One millimeter precision where? On the very extended arms when it's fully extended. Um, you've got a lot of movement in robot arms, a lot of different degrees of freedom. Um, quite tricky. I was reading, um, there's something interesting was, um, what's her name? Um, Chinese maker. Uh, I forget what her name is. But she was talking about there are lots and lots of companies making robot arms now, low cost robot arms in China. However, very few of them do any good software, interestingly. Um, so I might explore some of those robot arms at some point. Um, you can actually build your own if you've got a 3D printer. But they tend to be quite chunky. Um, so the price has come down considerably, but it's still, you know, it can still be an investment. Um, and as, as, as was said, you know, it's the software tends to be very poorly supported, very basic. Um, all depends what you want to do, but I mean, if you're going to do lots of work with robotics, um, sort of, uh, arm robotics, you need things like inverse kinematics and all of that kind of stuff. Um, that tends to be much harder to do. Um, companies tend to go with proven solutions for that kind of stuff. But it does depend what you're trying to do with it. Anyhow, so on to the software side of things. You can use forward kinematics as well. As I say, it depends what you're trying to do as to what you need. But if you're going to offer a solution, then you want to be able to uh, 
add in all of the different components. Um, because you need things like voxel and space planning as well. It depends where you're operating it and what environment you're operating it in, etc. Some of it can be very challenging. Let me just turn this image off. Let's get back to where we were with the code. Right, so let's just go and do a reminder to where we were last week. And now I'll talk about what we're going to do moving forward. Turn that down a bit. Everyone read that okay, by the way. My audio is good, isn't it? I better check. You know, the one time I didn't check last week, it was, it was off. <laughs> until Laurie said something uh, typical and I don't know why that was it's because I updated my windows and it did something with the driver so Laurie says he's got um, okay can I um, look that up uh, Laurie's saying he's got some Kickstarter robot arms. So, what's the first one? U arm. Is that the really simple one based on servos? Hold on, let me turn this on. Uh, why can't I see that? Hold on. This one, Larry. Yeah, I got the right one. Put a miniature industrial robot arm on your desk. Yeah, I don't think this would have the accuracy that iPost would requ require, but it would, it's um, nice to play with. I think these ones are servo driven, aren't they? As in uh, like uh, RC servos rather than um, traditional, uh, you know, regular motor servos. Is there a oh, playing a xylophone look? <laughs> I guess you've got quite a bit of movement on the end as well with things like this. Yeah, it looks like regular RC servos. Yeah, it's all, all the joints of their RC servos, aren't they? Still, it's cool and relatively low cost. What? How much were these? I think um, I might know the guys that did this. Who's a bell? $69 for the first one. if you want the grippers and that's a bit more mm. which reminds me I should put a bit more light on this situation oh this chair sounded squeaky now Yeah, that looks cool. So um, presumably when you drive these, you just need the old servo uh, pulse width control.
my post just said uh, I noticed the type I'm looking for are way too expensive they can be very expensive indeed um, yes well controlling those is fairly easy Laurie have you tried doing it from an FPGA I mean you can do it from an Arduino it's that easy to control them so it's just a pulse width um, that controls the position of each joint Um, let me see who was it that did the uh, what's that mean? God, is it some? Um, well, I tell you who was using one recently that looked really cool. It's Jonathan Oxter. Uh, Jonathan Oxter. Oh, is it Oxter? I can't remember his Twitter, Twitter handle. Jonathan. Uh, I might not even be following him on Twitter. He did some work with one of the arms that came from uh, China. Hold on. Hold on, I know how to find him. He's got a YouTube channel. He's based in Australia. Uh, um, Uh, damn it. Um I'm done. I've watched one of his recently. Let me just look at my um history. There we go. Superhouse TV. Um hold on. What is his um Hi, okay. Uh John Oxo. Does he have his Twitter handle here? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Has he got any links? Bear me a sec, folks. I'm sure he's got a um, why doesn't it show me his links? Superhouse site, Twitter. Here we go. Superhouse is his tweet Twitter account. Gotta follow this. Um so let's see if he mentions it here. Yes. It's this work with Chris. Uh he's saying here Daniel can move independently, meet David, he's got a nice one. Machine learning.
Oh, I don't know. This is some of the guys that he's working with and he's trying to automate uh yeah it's not going to be in there hold on it's not that one bear with me Hmm. You look in the background, he's designed uh, this, um, I think it's like a water hose thing that puts fire out, robotic water hose. Um, but this, he has recently. How do I know this? Where did I see it? He's recently got one of these robot arms from China that he's trying to use with um, to to do uh, automation for um, some disabled folks and stuff. Home automation, no super house, house hangout. Maybe I wonder if he does this on a different. Um, Home automation, home automation. I wonder, hold on. Uh, super, let me just do a search. TV. Oh no, super house. Uh, automation robot arm. I can't see to find it, guys. Oh, he's got one here, the My Robot. No. Damn it. Hmm. Um, I wonder if there's anything in his Twitter feed. Hold on. I've seen it somewhere. Open energy. I wonder if he's got another account or something. Bear with me, folks. Mm, I can't see it in his Twitter feed. Freetronics, that was one of his companies. Or is. I can't see anything about robot arm here. Where on earth did I see him using it? Yes, P. Thanks, Jennifer. Damn. Can't find it. I will have to return to this. I need to locate those. Um, 
those arms that he was using. Apologies, folks. Maybe he's just not done the video yet. Maybe I just saw some pictures that he posted. Anyhow, uh, let me just catch up with the, with the chat. Um, so, uh, no, I didn't try to do that from the FPGA, said Laurie. Uh, I did a Black Ice 2 mobile robot a while ago. One of the people I used to do the Lego robots with sent me a link to Chris's channel. Okay, what's this? James Bruton. I know this name from somewhere. He's done loads of stuff, hasn't he? He's got a very good YouTube channel. Look at this. Wow. How cool is all of this? Wow, 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 wow. Extraordinary. Oh, he's got an inverse kinematics then. It's cool. Yeah, I shall have to look through some of this. I have heard of this guy. I remember. I think I may have seen one or two of these. Clickbot. Let <laughs> Wolverine. <laughs> wow. Okay. Um, what else is here in the chat? Um, my most sophisticated use of robot is probably with my Roomba robot that runs a robotic operating system, Ross, and maps the house with its slam. Cool. Um, you also did some TensorFlow or object recognition with it. Yeah, Ross is quite popular. I think it's overkill in a lot of cases, but yeah. It's kind of cool. Well, what's it showing me down here? Hmm. And uh, I post sent a link. Is this the robot arm that you were looking at? Oh yeah, it's only yeah, nearly twenty nine thousand dollars. Yeah, that's kind of cool. What did you want to do with it? Anything in particular, I post? Do you have a plan for it? Or you just want to play with some robots? Robot arms. Uh, hmm. How far does this go back date-wise? How far did I look? Uh, some of the assistive stuff. Um, uh, I can't see if he's got the robot arm in that one. I think maybe it's something he's working on and that will come out later. I definitely saw pictures of him using it and he was talking to these um, suppliers in China about these robot arms. Yeah, it's not there. 
I think maybe he's just not done that yet. Okay. Well, moving swiftly on, we, we will come back to that. You're going to have to save up if you want that uh, I post. D U R E U R free E. Ouch. Um, I want to use it to solder fine connectons, connections. Have you seen that one that does the through hole ones from underneath? I post. Oh, there's another robot here from Nori. Uh, it won't let me go in. Why does it want me to sign in? I don't want to sign in. Hmm. That's bonkers. Greek granddad. Oh, geek granddad. Sorry. <laughs> Oh, come on, let me in. Oh, don't make me sign in. What the hell is wrong with this? I haven't been on WordPress for ages. Um, I think I've got a blog on WordPress. I think that's why it's asking me to sign in. Let's try that. No, I think it's just intercepting me, being too clever. Sorry. Oh, dearie. Oh, oh yeah. Uh, I do have a blog, you know. I haven't used it in years. I should dig it out. I can't remember what the link is. Is this where I should be looking? There's a robot arm. Yeah, that worked. Social robot. Cool. So you got ultrasonic distance sensors, tracked robot. What's that? A mobile phone that you've used on it? Android. Cool. What's that? Bluetooth or Wi-Fi or what? Uh. Yeah, an eight two six six module. Wi Fi. Yeah, it's cool, man. Good. I want to have Bluetooth on the hours um, and maybe Wi-Fi as well. I'm just, the jury's still out as to what I put on their Wi-Fi wise. Okay, right. Back to the code, guys. Uh, before you got distracted from, from FPGAs, but we'll get you back into that because I want to do some robot stuff, definitely. Um, and there's a really good uh, FPGA story. So let me just get rid of this browser. Hold on. Let's go back to the code. So um, where were we on the code? Let's do that, shall we? Right. Let me just lock this chair because otherwise it's going to creak. Oh, my black mice uh, MX are done. I'm going to put them back in stock this week. And I've done the breadboards as well. Got my ultrasonic uh, cleaning bath working again. 
which is good. A um, whole load of goodies on that front. Let me wreck the place. <laughs> Go there. the whole lot toppling down if I'm not careful. <laughs> Ta-da! Lots of black ice and breadboards and stuff. Do I start shipping these again? The MX boards. ready to go which is kind of cool um, so back to the code anyhow so we I we ported most of it oh wait a minute what's this Ro Romba with a U arm yeah I've heard about this this rings a bell I love the one where the cat's on the Roomba dressed as a shark Oh wow, yeah, look. Sorry, I've turned the browser off. Nice. There's only one thing missing from that picture. A CFPGA, mate. Or is that there underneath? Can't tell. So you've got a Raspberry Pi, an Arduino Leonardo. Quite a lot of problems with the UARM servos. Hmm. <laughs> cool. Right. So back to the um, slightly less interesting stuff. We will get back to robotics, don't you worry. That will happen. I'm determined. So what are we going to do today? Well, let's remind ourselves where we were. Um, this helps lead to some of the robotic stuff anyhow, longer term. Uh, and this will start connecting back to the stuff we did before. Um, so we ported to RTIC, uh, which is short for our real time um, interrupt concurrency. So this is the Rust framework. Uh, as a result, we now have something that is um, probably looks a lot nicer. And I pushed this up. I know you were following iPost at some point. And then you had to dive off. Um, I think where we got to before when when it ended was um, I was creating a bunch of tasks at the end that I was calling out from here. I was creating a send, an SPI send and a um, SPI reset uh, soft task. And then I was running into problems because it was complaining um, that I hadn't set up some uh, interrupts or something like that to enable the um, soft tasks to operate. So I kind of got stuck and that's where we left it. However, I didn't really need those soft tasks anyhow. So I went back and did it properly. And what I did was I refactored out the SPI parts. So if we look at the top now, we now have a, a separate soft SPI struct. Okay. Um, that takes, you know, as its um, resources, um, the necessary SPI pins, 
the reset pin to reset the FPGA and um, uh, the delay resource for calculating the delays. And then the implementations, new, which just returns, you know, uh, the struct. And then there's a reset function. And that goes through and puts the FPGA into reset, uh, ready to be programmed dynamically. Uh, there's a select and a deselect, which is really just for activating the CS line because that's now under the control of this because it's under here. And then um, the ability to use a delay that's built in here. Um, milliseconds delay and then of course the send uh, which basically just serializes and bit bangs the uh, relevant s c k and mozzie pins including the delays and that's the same code as was in the old version it's obviously been refactored now into this um, soft spi structure and implementation And unlike the bit bang um, uh, how that we looked at, this doesn't escalate the uh, errors, so we don't get all the type issues and all those complications. Um, the other struct resources that we bring in here are the serial, um, the serial port, the USB device. Um, we bring in the uh, soft SPI as part of this structure. Uh, the header um, boolean which we had all of these existed under the USB serial structure in the previous version so here we're using resources so resources are basically a struct containing all the things that we need to use inside our interrupts uh, inside our idle when we're setting setting these resources up and also in um, the unit as well and any soft tasks that we want it's a way of sharing resources so these get cleverly um, wrapped uh, into mutating references um, that, that can be safely used effectively the other thing that I did was I managed to move the memory in to the init function. So the init function, just to remind you, gets run once in the Arctic framework. Uh, and this is really just for setting up those resources. You'll see the resources are very similar to what we had before. The other, the other thing that's probably not obvious here is you have this parameter for the application um which basically says which how we're using and it handles passing in the device for us safely uh, and enabling the peripherals um, and then the application itself starts off with this function so you don't have a main here uh, you have an app effectively so the init gets run once and that's really just for co configuring stuff this looks very similar to the you know in our main the first bit before it goes into the loop um, setting up the clocks, etc. Um, we're obviously putting the flash into a safe position so it doesn't get affected by any of the soft SPI writes. Um, the this one here is where we're setting the master clock out. If you remember, that outputs a 16 megahertz signal that gets passed to the FPGA, which we need and then we create the usb bus device um, which we're doing here we actually that's actually wrapped in a in a sum um, to enable self what do they call it in a mutation was it self mutation in a mutation i think so any changes to it occur by its own measure and not outside um setting up the serial point and the usb cdc device this is pretty much the same as before and we're also setting the uh leds on in this particular case 
we're also resetting our header and byte counts. Uh, previously, we did that in the setup of the USB serial device. Uh, we're creating an SPI device, a soft SPI device, which was this new structure that we've added in. And then what we do is we return all the things for the structure. And what they call that is a late resources. We're returning late resources. So these are all the parts that make up that structure. It gets returned into resources. So all these things haven't been configured, get returned to that resource control uh, structure. Then you have an idle uh, thing, which is like your loop in main effectively. But in this case, it's not really doing anything. We have a no instruction thing there, just so it compiles. Um, and then we have another task. It has this idea of tasks, right? Now in this case, because we've got a binds equals, that's saying that this task is a is bound to, in this case, an interrupt. So this replaces what we had before as the OTG underscore FS interrupt. So this is called anytime there's a USB event that causes an interrupt, whether that's power up, um, connections, or data transfers in or out. Um, Oh, I actually called that USB event here just to make that clear. All of these function tasks take what's called a context. And the context is the wrapper that enables us to get to the resources. OK, it's a safe wrapper. Um, here we're creating the uh, local um, reference handle to that wrap device, the USB CDC de device, effectively, uh, the serial port. Similarly, or the serial part of it, the soft SPI. So basically, we're loading those things we had in the structure from the context so that we can then use them. And then we're going to poll the USB device as we did before in the other version. If we get something, then we do what we were doing before. Um, the major difference here is we're calling out to the SPI now because that's an implemented structure. For the soft SPI. So that's actually calling the implementations on soft SPI uh, and also that one and also the reset, this one, as well as the select and the deselect, which is done down here. And that really is it. That's the big changes. But it's a lot neater now. There's a lot less. Um, clutter in terms of the wrappings because the wrap, a lot of the wrappings uh, safe wrappings are being handled for us so um any questions on that before i move on to what we're going to do today um i think laurie you've already looked at this code haven't you uh i don't know if um you had a chance i post to catch up But that now runs as well, by the way, most importantly. And uh, Laurie's checked at his end as well, and it runs, so that's good. My post's been catching up. Cool. So um, if we go back to our to-do list, so where are we? We should have added something to this. Um, so we did a whole load of black crab stuff, didn't we? Yeah. Oh, it's gone back to the wrong keyboard again. I wish it wouldn't bloody do this every single time. Um, so yeah, this is a bit out of date. Um, Oh, don't know if we should call it that anymore, but anyhow. Yeah, I don't think we need that. So this is part quirky. Um, parts.
I guess from three right through to where did we get up to? Was it part nine? Or was it part ten? No, part eight, I think. So what did we do? We did uh so we did Make a note of that. Failed. So initially we tried to use both, didn't we? So we could do um hold on. So that we could do um ooh. Tried to do the EEPROM as well, which didn't work. Sorry, I'm going back a little bit here, so I'll just make some notes. Um. Um, what was it called? Bit bang how, wasn't it? And then we manually we manually wrote uh, FPGA programming. FPGA, I guess, from the FPGA uh, prog from um, scratch. Three to seven, actually, and then and then in eight. Ported to uh, oh, tick 
and rotate uh, soft sprite. Laurie said another thing that iScore firmware does that we haven't got yet is UART to the FPGA. Yeah, that needs to happen. Let's list that actually because that's useful. Um, on our list um, and today what I wanted to do thanks for that thanks for reminding me um, Laurie that you are stuff's important um, add uh, QSBI SPI uh, FPGA interaction interaction is the right thing to call it In fact, what I'm going to do is I'm going to do, let's do two of these. Let's, I want to do this in two stages, actually. Let's break it down. Let's not try and run before we can walk. Let's do, what I want to do is do SPY first and then QSPI. Um, the reason I want to go that way around is because one of these, we've already done something very similar. The second one, we haven't. And there is overlap so um, let's leave that there so what I want to focus on today is this and if we get chance start that um, so there's 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 two uh, with well, the several connections between the STM32 on the, um, just remind you, this the right way up. On the ice core, between the um, STM32 there and the FPGA there is um, there's an SPI link which we uh, including reset and done which we use for programming the FPGA there is a TX and an RX which we can use so that if we've implemented a UART inside the FPGA we, we, we read that in through the UART and the STM32 that in turn we can use to send back up the USB for example which is what this point is here. Yeah. That's what that bit will be. Um, the other thing that we've got on there, as well as the SPI that we use for programming, is a QSPI connection. Now, the QSPI connection in this case doesn't go up to quad SPI, it only goes up to dual SPI. But it supports single SPI, dual SPI, 
Uh, and if we had more pins available, it would have supported quad. But on the particular, weirdly, on the STM32 F7, quad SPI wasn't available in, you know, a nibble. It was only available as double, i.e. DSPI or single SPI. Which is a bit annoying, but um, that's what we've got. Um, now QSPI itself is backward compatible with SPI, so you can put it into an SPI mode or DSPI or Quad SPI. In our case, eventually we will need to go to Quad SPI because that's what we're going to support in other versions of this. So for the robot board, for example, I expect there to be a Quad SPI link between the STM32 and the FPGA. Um, on out on the amalgam, then we're using the FMC bus, which is a different animal. Bear with me. Okay, um, so the plan is using the, exe the existing uh, SPI connection, which is soft SPI, um, we can start off using that. Why would I want to use that to start with? Let me just save this. Because we already have a very simple SPI implementation. Uh, that we can it should be relatively easy for us to reuse then once we get that working we can then move that over to the quad spi link in spi mode is what i'm thinking we then got some um, rtl that we we know works and that just enables us to get that working on qspi and then we can work on taking that up to dual spi etc it's a new library so do it in stages uh, let me just switch then because what we're going to switch to now is the nmigen side in fact before we do that let's just think about what we need on here so on here we are going to need um, We've already got send functionality here, which will send the byte. So all we need to be able to do effectively is um, after we've programmed, send a byte to, you know, what we program into the FPGA will be the SPI interface at the other end. So rather than putting in the um, trail LED pattern, We'd actually send the code that we're going to write in NMIGEN or that we're going to port in NMIGEN. And then that will enable us. So basically what I want to do is have it, this SPI code inside, written in my NMIGEN, running on the ICE core that basically takes a byte <coughs> from SPI to start with and displays it on the LEDs or four of them you know, the LSB of the byte. <coughs> Excuse me. So my functionality is already here in this class. Sorry, in this uh, structure and implementation. Got me saying it now. Sorry, that's your fault. And I guess where would we put that? I mean, we could put it, in, you know, in our idle loop, which is the equivalent to our old main loop. We'd need some sort of, um, we'd need to wrap it in a critical section because we're trying to use the soft SPI, um, which the interrupt is effectively using. Um, 
we'd also only probably want to send that SPI once programming, you know, was complete. So after we programmed, we probably want to set um, set something that we can check um, to make sure that we're in a position that we can then enter into an SPI transaction because we know that our uh, synthesized SPI receiver is running inside the FPGA. So um, the first thing we're going to need here is we're going to need resources. So the resources we're going to need to use or gain access to will be um, the SPI Uh, do I do idle function open resources equal like that I guess I'm sure it will tell me if I've got it wrong uh, and here we're going to need the SPI Uh, Laurie Griffiths is saying, do you have the NMIGEN on Black Ice working code in a repository yet? No, but I can add that in. That's not a problem. Um, I think you've got a copy of the um, NMIGEN version of the Black Ice MX stuff that we did from last time. But anyhow, we can sort that out. We can add that in. It's not a problem. Um, once I get it working, that is. Um, so I'm going to need SPI. What else am I going to need? So what else do we set? So after we programmed, let me just check something. So after we do the program, what do we set? We reset the header to true, and we reset the byte count to zero. Ah, so those are reset. So we can't look at byte count, for example. Okay, so let's add in one other Boolean called programmed. Yeah. Oh, stupid. Probe grasmed. Really? That's very clever. Um, initially, that needs to be true. So let's just set the initialization up on that byte count here. So we need that kind of thing. Here, programmed. Let's set that to false to start with. And that needs to go here. I need to pass that in. When we set things up. Okay. And then in here, once this is done. Um, we can add in uh, we can oh true 
Oh, I can't type today. What's up with me? Hmm. Uh, and I need to do this. Voila. So after it's done its first programming or subsequent programming, this will be true. Ooh, why is that a mismatched type? Oh, I've put the wrong type here. Okay, cool. So we're now ready. So what we could then say is um, in here we could have a section where we um, how do they do it? Right. Let me just switch back. They use a locked statement, don't they? Or lock. You just double check this because we need it in a critical section basically because we're going to be accessing things that could be changed by the interrupt and we're a lower priority so we need to um, be careful of what we do let me just find this there was a thing about this Critical section. So there we go. So here, what we're saying is, so that's an interrupt. There's two interrupts, but this one is a higher priority. This one had to use a critical section. So X in this case, yeah, because we were. That's actually because we're manipulating. Uh, manipulating it. I guess what we need I mean is it safe for us to do let's get hold of this first because um, we're going to need to know the state and we're also going to need the uh, spy resource Well, let's see X because we're now going to use that and what we really want to do here we won't need that anymore we would need to do something like if uh, programmed right then We'd need to do spy lock. Is that right? Spy dot lock. Can we do that? Spy. Doesn't seem to have lock on here. I'm sure it's lock. And then we have a um, yeah, it can't find that.
f increment fn once t max. So this lock is added to the spy type effectively because it's wrapped on this resource um, resources x resources x oh oh wait a minute Is that right? Um, do I do it this way as part of that struct? Talk. Yes. Yes, I do it that way. Um, and then what I need here is I need a closure. Um, Uh, I'm going to confuse myself here. Um, that should be the soft. Spy type. Like that, yeah, and then so this creates critical that wraps it in a critical section that lock effectively, uh, and then I can do in fact, let's just make that clear here. I can then start manipulating this. So, uh, if we're programmed, we can then, what can we do? We can then basically send our byte. Um, so we're gonna go spy dot, I need to select first. Uh, select. And then I need to send, don't I? Spy. Dot send. Whatever our byte is, um, well, that could be count, let's say, and then count. Um, Could 
the U8. Uh, it needs to be static, doesn't it? That counts. Right. Uh, equal. Zero. Initially. And then we can increment it here. Oh, what? And then we want to delay, don't we? Um, spy dot delay. <sighs> Was it milliseconds? I don't know. Just say 1000, shall we? Just for the moment, so one second. I say 100 milliseconds. So in other words, it should send, every 100 milliseconds, it should send the updated value of count. So our trick would th therefore be, so just, just to remind where we are, okay, before uh, I get the complaints of the compiler. Uh, Laurie's saying, so you are using the same SS as you're using for programming the FPGA. Yeah, because that's the SS pin on the FPGA. There's four pins connected to the FPGA. The uh, flash is still disabled at this point, so it's going to ignore it. Um, hmm, do I, I need a semicolon after that, don't I? Is that why it's... Why is it not like that? Is it because I've got multiple commands in here? Is it not like that? Anyhow, just to explain to what I'm doing here is um, That looks right. I don't know why it's complaining about that. Let me come back to that. So um, basically what this is going to do, so after it's programmed, the state of programmed is going to be true rather than false. So as it's going through this idle loop, when it's not being interrupted and stuff, if it sees it's programmed, it's basically going to get a lock on the SPI structure to prevent us trying to use it at the, at the same time as the interrupt, obviously. Um, so this gives us like a critical section and we are basically just going to send a byte the value of that byte is whatever count is um, which we are then going to increment every time we send it and then we're going to wait 100 milliseconds before we go around and do this again because we need a de delay in here um, Mm 
might want to add a guard where we set a uh, program to false when we're programming as well so that this doesn't try and run whilst we're programming in between uh, the interrupt calls right whilst I remember because otherwise that could be dangerous right so in the interrupt here of where we're doing program true we do a program false at the start So we repeatedly set that to true. At uh, false, sorry. So if it's receiving any stuff, it's disabled. It only gets enabled after we exceeded the count. Um, hopefully, what if it receives more characters? That could mess with it. Could that still be pro put to false afterwards? Or what if we're not programming it, we're communicating with it? Let's have this actually. Oh. Let's have this. Set to false straight after it recognizes the signature. So as soon as it goes into programming, the um, the FPGA, then it only gets set when it's finished. That's safer. I just want to make sure this doesn't run. Um, when the interrupt isn't being called, but yet it's still in the middle of writing to the FPGA, i.e. between receiving USB blocks. Um, for some reason, it doesn't like this. What am I doing wrong here that it's not liking? I'll tell you what, let's just run the, um, run this. Bim 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 historical commands okay let us solve some of these shall we the inevitable one thing I have noticed with the RTIC is if you even have the slightest error it messes with the whole code rewrite that's going on underneath in the framework so you get a whole trash load of errors that follow that some of which can disappear once you fix the the basic ones so here it's saying expected one off oh i forgot the colon that's what i forgot for the type separator my bad Anything else? Yeah, let's just do that again. What have we got now? 
uh, let us pi resource by cx resource spy let's get to the map resource spy hold on right mat at mat resources spy found oh that's interesting okay that's saying it prefers this because we're just looking at the wrapper here whatever's inside it but actually what's inside it i think is the soft spi Maybe I'm just using that. Okay. Ah. Um, I'm using more resources. I have to list the resources I'm using here. And it's noticed that I haven't. Because it kind of re exports them and wraps them in the framework. Minor bug there, but they may automate that one day. Who knows? Let's just recompile. We've gotten rid of a couple. What's next? Your sauce by help remove this type argument. Expected naught type arguments. It's because I've called this spy. This is a bit confusing name wise, isn't it? What happens if I do what it did before? Hmm. Let's call it spy R. Okay. For resource wrapper. I just want to make sure it doesn't make any difference. So what did it have there before it had, did it have, hold on, let's go back, let's change it back to what it was. Um, and let's just follow its suggestion. That, saying, I don't think it's actually going to allow this, but let me just follow their suggestion, see what it comes up with. Expect to that map resources, spy. Mark resources spy found struck resources SPI. Well, yes, because you just made me change that.
So they're mutably borrowing here. Good golly! What happens if I don't put a type here? You have to do the errors in order, otherwise, um, one of them can cause the others. No method name delay found on mutable reference at MUT soft spy in the current scope. Let me just put this in here because I might need that later. Um, a minute, let me just check. Doesn't, have I used the right... Um, oh, it's delay underscore ms. My bad. A milliseconds. It says microseconds there, that's bad. Have I written this wrong? Yes, that should be MS and MS Let me just catch up with the chat here. Why is not let spy So Laurie's asking about this here. Um, yes, if that would normally return a um, an at mut soft spy, right? So I was returning what's in there, but here I'm trying to get to the wrapper that's holding it on the outside. 
I believe, which I get the lock on. Um, what I did was I looked at an example. Um, where was that? Let me just see if this works out because I don't think I'm going to. I think that may be wrong anyhow, Laurie. And I may have to go back. But let me just see where I am with these errors. The trouble is, I've got to get rid of some of the errors so I can move on. Um, so here it's saying type cannot be dereferenced. That's because it wouldn't be like that if it's not a mutt. Of course. No field programmed. Doesn't like that. I spelt it wrong. Programmed. Programmed. What? Why does that not mean? No field programmed on type USB event resources. Uh, Ask is equals versus equals. What, 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 what? Um, <sighs> right, why doesn't it like that? Unknown field.
definitely there, look. This has me a little confused. Why won't it... Um, I mean, I'm accessing it in here, but... Can you see my mistake? Unknown field. And used import mutex. Why is it complaining about that all of a sudden? On type USB event. Ah, oh, I, I bet I've misnamed this. Of course I have. I'm being a dipshit, aren't I? Sorry, too much copy and paste here. It's not USB event. Oh, that's right. Idle context. CX resources. Idle context. It's definitely the idle function. No field programmed on type USB event resources. Why is it calling them USB event resources? Those are USB event resources. Oh, am I looking at the wrong error? 237. I am. being an idiot sorry I'm just half asleep clearly I don't feel that asleep but I am I didn't include it on my list you have to include everything silly me so complaining that program was program expected mapball found struck program Expected at Mutbool. A mutating reference found struct programs. Hey. Two one two, right? It's so expecting that it should be right. It's founding found struct programmed. But programmed isn't a struct. Um Where's my mistake here, guys? What am I doing wrong? Right, let me just do a refill of my water. Give me a sec. And I shall be back, guys. So I also need a break. A toilet break.
I'm back again, folks. Sorry about that. Family duties calling. Um, right, I'm going to change this. There's a few things I don't like about this. Um, I don't think I need that. Hold on. What happens if I do this? I want to put this back to um, I want this to be the same. I'm going to actually lock not on spy but on programmed even though I'm not changing programmed just because it's a primitive type it's easier to do that okay Bear with me. So I'm just refactoring this, see if it will accept it. it looks more sensible mismatch types let's buy <laughs> and that just reversed exactly what I had before. Hold on, what's going on here? That should be right. Mismatch times flat, that much of spy. Equal. Oh, these need to be. That's it as well, must I remember? dereferenced <sighs> right so back to this so why Expected due to this. Expected at map soft spy found struck resources dot spy code on spy. It's almost like he's got a memory from the last compile. That's weird. So what is going wrong here? Because that is exactly the same. Two one two. It's exactly the same as I'm using here, as Laurie said. That shouldn't that shouldn't be an issue, right? Unless there's something weird about idle. Can I not have resources in idle? I'm sure I can. I need to find an example, really, don't I? See if they're doing anything different. Idle colon colon context. Hmm. 
Yeah, that's following the uh, the right pattern. Resources dot spy. Oh, hold on, hold on. Right, let me have a quick look. Let me just look something up quickly. I want to see if there's any examples of resource usage in idle. Oh, okay. Guess what, folks? <laughs> Note that shared resources cannot be accessed from idle. Attempting to do so results in a compile error. Oh, bollocks. Excuse my French. Good job this isn't a child-friendly channel. Why on earth are the resources not shared? in the idle section does it say anything else so the idle section is pretty useless really Whoa, wait, wait. Right, hold on. Let me share this with you because it's confusing the hell out of me. Um, oh, you can already see it, can't you? What on earth is going on here? Because up here it says. In here, look. Uh -uh. And it says underneath, note that the shared resources resource cannot be accessed from idle. Tempted to do so results in a compile error. Is that because of the type of thing it's being shared? So what's it talking about? Resource shared. What's shared? Shared here. Maybe it needs to be a specific type. That's a shared type. Because if you scroll down here, look at this example. That doesn't have an idle, does it? Late resources. So here, these are marked as late resources. Because they're returned, which is exactly what I'm doing. Hold on. Exactly what I'm doing. <clears throat> so in this example, you've got a resource struct here, and this has C. What the hell weird thing is this? consumer static and then in idle look it's accessing c da -da -da -da. maybe this is a special
The example below uses lake resources to establish a lockless one-way channel between UART naught interrupt handler and the idle task. A single producer, single consumer queue is used as the channel. The queue is split into consumer and producer endpoints in init. Okay. Right. And then each endpoint is stored in a different resource. UART0 owns the producer resource and idle owns the consumer resource. So in that case, It's a special type that can be shared. Is that what I'm saying? <laughs> what do you reckon I post? If it's a certain thing, look at that type there. Consumer static U32 U4. is wrapped in a certain way this is using a producer consumer pattern um, ew there was a limitation here I was previously unaware of So what it seems to be suggesting is that I need a channel. I wonder if I can do it via um but that's no good because I still need access to the SPI. Mmm. That's a weird one. I didn't expect that to happen. Holy moly! Always something tripping us up. Interesting. So I don't want it to be sent from the interrupt. This is something separate to the interrupt. Bless me. Oh, that puts a bit of a spanner in the works. Hmm. Um, we'll just look at something here.
Hmm. I wonder if I can access um devices. I mean, there is another way of tackling this. We don't need to use the idle function. But the, the idle function is looking a bit weird. What we can actually use is software tasks. Um, let me just check that software tasks can use stuff. None of these are using shared resources. So I don't know if that's supported. Interrupt task. Task. This task. This is a software task and that's got access to resource X. Whatever resource X is. So it looks like Uh, let's take a look at the code. Oh, that's the code that's generated. Hold on. I mean, we don't have to use idle. Um, we can use a specific task. But what's interesting here is in this um, this example of using tasks, right? So they've created two tasks, one called bar, one called baz, <sighs> like they do. But they've 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 spawned these from the interrupt. So I mean, we could spawn this after successfully programming. And these tasks can definitely receive resources because if you look at this one, it's got resource listing here. So we could do it in a task rather than in idle. Let's have a look a bit further down. <clears throat> mm. 
This looks a bit more complex. Spawn API is exposed to the user as a method of spawn struct. There is one spawn struct per task. Ready, spawnable tasks. What's this here? Oh, this is generated. Hold on. So that's the example. I don't get this bit. Why do they need to put that in there? I don't know what that bit's doing there. That's very confusing. Okay, so let's just, just think about this for a sec. Say we go with tasks rather than idle because we need to share resources, right? So in this example, there's an interrupt driven thing here, just like we've got. And that is spawning these tasks, one called bar and one called baz. Those tasks are defined here. So this is the uh, task um, implementation. I'm not sure what the capacity is. I'll come back to that in a minute. Priority one, priority one. So these can be different priorities. I don't know what the capacity is. Is that the number of these tasks that can run? Maybe. Um, and I have no idea what the hell that's doing there because you are one isn't referred to anywhere in here. Is that meant to be you are zero? That's weird. Maybe it's a mistake. Typo. Then it says the framework produces the following task dispatcher. Blah, 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 blah. Yeah. The spawn code generated by the framework for the previous example looks like this. So it seems to create two things. It creates this. Framework produces the following task dispatcher, which consists of an interrupt handler and a ready queue.
I think they've just done a typo. I think this interrupt up here should be interrupt one. And that's where we would spawn a task from. Um, let's should we just have a go and see what happens? That'd be fun, won't it? Here he is, that will be fun. We soon find out. I don't get this interrupt thing, but that problem that we had, if you remember I post before, that might solve that. So let's change this to task, right? And um, I think we have to have a capacity. I'll just copy what they used for the moment. A capacity of two. All right, and I'll call it um, Exchange. Well, it's not exchange, is it? It's like send, isn't it, really, I suppose? Is that right? And this would have to be sport. would have to be spawned in here at this point after this has happened after it's deselected spawn uh, no spawn Born, um, send. No, it's a really bad name. Let's say manage. Um, I'm not, do I need to pass anything in? Let's just assume not for now, and then we have to do okay, right? <clears throat> no, 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 no. Wish it wouldn't do that. So that spawns it after it's programmed. Spawn manage. We're going to call this manage. Um, I 
the other thing we have to do is we have to have a in here we have to have a spawn and we need to include what we're spawning in here oh my god what's wrong with my typing yeah I'm going to keep that here I'm going to add this in a sec hold and hold is that all I need to do Don't need that. <sighs> Let's see what the compiler makes of this. Doesn't return anything. Oh, I'm going to type out. Okay, I post. I'll see you in a bit when you've finished your um, suppers. Not enough external interrupts. Oh! Guys, really sorry. I should have turned the browser off. You can't see me coding. Uh, so what I did is I've renamed this as a task called manage. Yeah. I added this capacity which you need. And then I've spawned that at the end of this USB event. Okay, and in order to do that, I had to add this spawn signal here. And then I'm getting this, error. when I compile, I get this error, which is what we had last term. Not enough external interrupts to dispatch all the software tasks needed. So what we were missing last time is that weird bit at the end here. I don't quite know why I have to put that in. Uh, but this needs to be the OTGFS. No. Is it the OTG event? Is it that? Extern interrupts can't be used as hardware tasks. Does this need a any old? Oh no, let's just put you out one. What happens if I do that? Field spawn on type USB event. No field spawn. 
I'm pretty sure in the example that they did it on, oh, they did it on the name of the function. Which is this. Pretty sure it's how they did it. Let me just double check. Um, hold on, so let's just switch back so that you guys can see. On this one, the name of the function, the interrupt in this case, is called foo, right? And that's what spawn is being called on to call bar. <clears throat> that name foo and it's got bar and baza spawns in here why won't it let me do what I'm doing Kinda looks right. USB event, which is the name of my function for this interrupt here. Got spawn manage. Interesting, but not helpful. USB event dot spawn. No field spawn and type. <sighs> right, let's have a quick look at 
Arctic. Oh dear, this was all going to be so simple, yet look what happens. Right, I'm just going to have a look on the Arctic repo examples. Spawn. Use Cortex init task. So they're spawning from init. You, that's interesting. So you can spawn from init. However, look at their example. They're using foo spawn. Where the fuck does foo come from? There's no foo in here. Oh, there. They're using the function name to spawn. So it's the other way around. That's totally different. They've obviously changed it. So it'll be manage spawn. And then they use unwrap as well rather than okay it's interesting that they're calling it from in it maybe i should use unwrap here Let's try that. Let just turn this off a sec. When in doubt, refer to the source. Ew. Weird. Method not found in. <laughs> Let's just go back to example. Hold on. Oh, it's my typing look. a dimwit mm -hmm. not found in manage Duplicate lang item in crate, I don't want them in. Manage. Not found in manage. Really? Doesn't know what manage is in the IDE. But manage is mentioned here. It's definitely there. Does it matter? Does the order matter? Oh, 
God. What happens if I don't call it from here? And I call it from here. Does it treat it any differently? No, it's the same issue. A module manager it thinks it's a module. Thinks it's a module. Wow. What other spawn is there? Definitely does it that way. See, all the examples do do it that way. So this example, tasks.rs, which is in their repo. We've got a task here, look, called foo. Right. That is spawned from init. And it's spawned using this foo colon colon spawn to unwrap. Which is, I believe, what we're doing. And then within that task, that task then spawns bar, look, and it uses the same bar colon colon. God damn! Right, is there an interrupt one here? Interrupt. Do they have an interrupt hardware RS? Yes, but there's no spawning. Hold on. Extern spawn RS. What the bloody hell's that? Use crate foo. Function foo. Pretty function implementation. It's confusing. Not helpful. Task. 
cards because there's another one here look two two this is a module that's why it's using that's using module oh this is confusing me is actually a good looking example too but 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 still using the same syntax God damn. If we go back to our example. <sighs> holy, holy, holy. It shouldn't be this difficult, surely. When we do manage code and kernel spawn to unwrap, this is not found in manage. It doesn't know what manage is. So it's thinking that that, hold on a guy, hmm, maybe it's just, how does it know? Holy, no, 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 no. I, I'm making this hard on myself with these tasks. There is another way of doing this. I'm just going to back off here, get rid of the tasks. Then I'm going to do something else. I am going to... Put this directly in so after we program in the interrupt yeah I'm not going to spawn anything let's forget that for the moment let's do We're going to do this spy. Transfer. Okay. Count.
and you get rid of all this crap. Oops, when it went on a transfer, I want to do Hold on. let's just do this. Otherwise, we're going to be here all day. I'll come back to the software tasks after. And here also, I'm going to do spy dot delay 100 milliseconds before it does the transfer. So I don't need to keep sending it. I'm just going to send it once, just to start with. I'll come back to the other thing. Oh. So we just send one for the moment. Let's forget all the um um what do I want to send to so, um, no. I need to send zero. That's what I need to send. Something's falling over. Right on. Hold on. I can and wheels are falling on the floor. Right.
So I'm not doing any separate um, tasks or any of that for the moment. We can come back around to that later when I've checked a few things out. So I've just added a transfer function, which literally just does a byte transaction on SPI over soft SPI. I'm just calling that after a delay, which should set it. So it's not going to count anything up or anything like that. Or I could do, I could say, actually, send bytes so after it's programmed it, it go and do something nice like for um what do we want uh how many numbers how many times do we want to go we want to do Um, something like that, don't we? Hold on. We want to count. Four. No, we want to count to fourteen, sixteen, uh, sixteen, fifteen. Right, so if we get all the fancy task stuff, let's just do the basics first, right? Oh. Oh. My bad. Open OCD is not running. Um, let's just run PowerShell with that. Very important. Again, that looks better. Continue. Then I have to um, send it something. I mean, it's not going to do anything at this point because I haven't got any firmware on there. Um, so I need to do the firmware first, don't I? Is there any point in doing this until I've done the firmware? Well, I can see that it doesn't break things, I guess. Normal um, USB operation.
Okay, so that's running. And it's probably done the transfer now. Not that we can see any change on the output, of course, because I've just sent it the trail binary. I just want to run the trail binary again. I just want to make sure we haven't messed with multiple programming. Yeah, that still works. Okay, good. Right, so the next stage, so for now, I'm just going to send those incremental things. I'm not going to run a separate task to do that in or try and do it in idle. I'm just going to do it in here. Because what I want to get to is to the point that we got it communicating. We can run, worry about solving the task problems later. So let's get rid of that now. How are we doing for time anyhow? Blimey. I'm going to be out of time in a minute. Um, damn. Might have to do the rest of this tomorrow night, guys. I'm afraid. Cause it's 20 past 11 here now. I've been going for uh, doo -doo 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 -doo, three hours and 20 minutes. Um, Laurie, is it all right if I do this tomorrow evening? I'm not sure there's any point in starting to do the Mijin bit at this point in time. I'll do that tomorrow evening. What do you think, Nori? Call it an evening and carry on tomorrow evening. You know, do a seven o'clocker tomorrow, 7 p.m. perhaps. No answer. Right. Well, I'm going to continue this tomorrow, guys. That I post now. I'll, I'll post a message on Discord as well. So let's pick this up tomorrow at 7 p.m. and then we do the MMIGEN bit. If we can get that working, we then work on to using the Quell SPI. All right, guys. See you in the morrow. <laughs>